me get my notes out. And I trust that you all have a set of notes. And I am going to very definitely be done at 4.30, okay, or 4.25. I have an intricate alarm system set up on my new phone, but I decided not to use it because it probably would go off at the wrong time because I'm just learning how to use this phone. But I promise, I want to promise you from the outset that you, I'm not going to have, uh, ha have you stick around late. I am happy to stay after the lecture for, for as, lo as long as anybody wants to talk or chat or sit outside or have a coffee or what have you. And then also students in my, my Understanding the Bible class, this is a little different version of one of the classes we do when we study Petrine primacy. The texts in Matthew, Luke, and John. Who did I leave out? For interesting reasons, Mark doesn't have texts about Peter's primacy, but we'll discuss that another time. I want you to take your hand out and I'm, I'm just going to show you what's on it so you know what to expect, all right? Part one is titled The Petrine Primacy Texts, and this is what the main thing that you're here to hear about. I, I have uh, discovered, let me see if we can get a slide. I've got to make sure I'm hitting this right. This, this gives you a quick view of the slides, really. But you see all these black letters with gold in the background? That's the title of my talk, Black on Gold, so, so you know what the title is. They're, they're about six feet high, <laughs> and they, they run all the way around the interior of St. Peter's Basilica. There you see some way up at the top dome. We'll be looking at uh, each of these. There's the Holy Spirit window that I have this less bright. The sun's not shining through my postcard, but the sun is shining at that point. And it's shining through what's called the baldacchino. It looks like two poles, but there's actually four. You just can't see the back two. And they're very ornately carved, and there's a lot of cool information about those pillars that I won't have time to go into today. But you'll have plenty of time when you are, oh, there the sun really came out. And you've, you've heard of ex cathedra statements of the Pope. Ex cathedra means from the chair. I, I heard all members of my class who are learning elementary Greek, and then I heard a few others, so congratulations. The chair is up there. The cathedra. Cathedra in, is Greek, but the Latin took the same form, cathedra, in, in different letters, of course. Okay, just to let you know wh where we are headed, we are going to take a tour of the interior and look at that text that goes around the entire... Imagine this room where St. Peter's, and way the heck up there, you've got the black on gold text, and it goes around the entire basilica, except for the part by, above the back doors. That's the only place where it stops. And so... My first page leads you through the text. Now, who's looking for a good mystery novel to write? We need someone who's a good writer, who loves mystery. It's got to have a lot of, like, murder plots in it, because I like that. Nobody has to die. And you need to have a religious theme, so it's like a thoroughly Catholic theme, but it doesn't hit you over the head with Catholicism. It's woven in there, so it's deeply Catholic, kind of the way Walker Percy or Flannery O'Connor write, Catholic, or Graham Greene writes Catholic novels. So I need, I don't need a volunteer now, but some, this is a long-term project that I'm not going to get to in my lifetime, and I'm a terrible writer. Uh, I write okay theologically and philosophically from time to time, but when it comes to a novel, it's just, uh, uh, I started rereading Graham Greene's The Heart of the Matter last night, because my daughter went nuts over how great it was, so I'm rereading it, and I, I said, I'm never going to write my mystery novel. But I have discovered something in these texts that is the perfect basis for a mystery novel. So if any of you 
I'll, I'll tell you what it is. That we'll discover it in just a minute. Okay, if you look to part two, it says the Holy Spirit window, which I've already talked about, the Baldacchino, which I've already talked about, and sacramentality, which is perhaps the most important thing you'll hear, you will hear here this afternoon. The principle of sacramentality. Let me try not to say anything right now, even though I'd love to. Part three on the back of page one is called The Church as One Holy Catholic and Apostolic. If we run out of time, as I almost always do, we, we won't get to that. But I'm planning on getting to it because it's pretty cool and it can be done pretty quickly. Now you're going to freak out. You're going to say, Lowry, you said you're going to, we're going to be out of here at 4.30? No way. Part five, four, and it goes on, and there's a, oh, man. It gets, so part four is definitely not for today. It's your optional homework. Okay? Those of you in my class, this comes right out of the class. So if you do it tonight, you're, when, when uh, November comes along, you'll be all done. It does a further analysis of the Petrine texts and some of the interesting mysteries involved in these texts. And especially on the last page where there's a box, this is all about this very interesting phenomenon in John's Gospel. Unfortunately, in the Basilica, they ran out of room. When they got to John, they got Matthew's text. It's really long. They got Luke's text. It's really short. Mark doesn't have a text, thank God. Uh, when they get to John's text, it's really long, and they're left with one transept, one little section. And so they only squeeze a little bit of it in, and it's got huge potential. And you can study it by being in the box. You know, they always say, think outside the box. It's good to think inside the box sometimes. And then the back, you'll find very intriguing. I'm going to say ac actually a few words about the back map right now, just so you can kind of get used to putting yourself inside of St. Peter's. Okay? This is just so you get used to it. How many of you have been in St. Peter's before? I'm going to guess a third. And I'm just a little bit off, but not too far. Okay. Now, when you enter St. Peter's, one thing you've got to avoid is coming at a time when it's really crowded. Because most of the day, it's like a museum. And if you like museums, that's OK. But if you want to have not only a museum, but <laughs> the greatest church in the world, and you want some meditative silence, and you want to go to Mass, you might want to go at a, uh, at a quieter time pretty hard to find a quieter time. Let me recommend arriving at quarter to seven in the morning. Uh, I did this two or three times in Rome. Monsignor Fucinaro went with us once or twice. And we would, it meant getting up at five o'clock. You get on the train. Then you take the subway. And then it all goes very smoothly. And, and then you take a nice walk. And you end up on the porch, front porch of St. Peter's at quarter to seven, and I think I remember seeing the moon still up uh, on a beautiful day. S sun hadn't come out yet, and they open the doors at seven, and it's quiet, and there's a few groups of pilgrims, maybe two or three small groups where there are masses going on. You can kind of just quietly join one of them as long as you stay in the back and, and go to ma early mass. It's a, a marvelous time to go. So I highly recommend it, and you can sleep some other time. Uh, it's well worth getting up at 5 o'clock. The other neat time to go, I, I've got it, don't worry. The other neat goal is at night. Try to imagine this under the moonlight. Go with a friend, or two or three or four, and you'll enjoy it a lot. Let me, let me tell you one quick thing of the many that I'd like to tell you about the St. Peter's Square, which is what you're looking at. The actual St. Peter's is 
right here. And this picture is, you can cl climb up on the roof, not, not like with ropes and things. You, <laughs> you take an elevator and a staircase and then you walk out on the roof. And th after you walk out on the roof, you go back in and go up inside the upper dome. This is worth its weight in gold. Would you pay $75 to do that? It's only about eight bucks. It's a bargain. <laughs> and you get to see all these really neat saints. And look out, and you, if you've got a map of Rome and a good sense of direction, you can locate all sorts of things. You can't quite see our campus, I don't think, which is quite a distance. But you can see all sorts of fascinating things. I remember having lunch on faculty day years ago with uh, classics. And we got onto the topic of St. Peter's. And as far as I know, you know a, 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 obviously a genius. I don't think he's uh, not supposed to be talking about other professors. I, I'm, I'm not sure that he's like really into the Catholic thing. He, he said at lunch to me, I've never been more moved than when I, was, when I walked for the first time into St. Peter's Square. And then he included all, the whole experience of St. Peter's. He said, that was the most moving moment of my whole life. And I'll tell you, another person who said the same thing, those of you into golf, who, who likes to follow professional golf? There we go. Got a couple more people. OK. Phil Mickelson took his wife years and years ago. She's an art aficionado. Took her on an Italian trip. And she said the highlight was St. Peter's. And they're not Catholic. So I, I, I re really, I think your name is Amy. I, I, I really admire that. I'm going to tell you one quick thing before we lose this slide. You'll notice the pillars. And you'll notice that, like right up here, you can see that there's not just one pillar in the front. There's a second pillar. And there's actually a, there's th three of them. OK, so there's three rows of pillars going around. And obviously, from where we're looking, uh, they're not all, I mean, you can see the, the two or three right next to each other. And you'd have to walk to get these, two these three lined up with each other. So you can only see the first one. You'd have to walk somewhere over here. And of course, all the others would be out of focus. Well, there's an awesome spot. There are two, two huge fountains. And there's an awesome spot to this side of this fountain, where there's a silver metal disc. I think it's about that big. And you can locate it. It's like finding a needle on the haystack. You can locate it by looking at other pilgrims kind of hovering around it and standing on it and like photo photographing this little disc or taking other pictures from the disc. So you know there's something going on here. You think that you know, maybe there are crazy people who think that this is where the UFOs are going to land or something. But in fact, what they're doing is looking at an architectural wonder. And that is if you stand on that one spot, no other spot on St. Peter's Square will do this for you. On that one spot, all the pillars line up with each other. The three line, line up, OK? And it's just and you take one step over, and suddenly they're out of, a little bit out of alignment. Another step more out of alignment, et cetera. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about that. Back inside the church, when you walk into the church, you walk through door number five, OK? Unless it's a holy year, and they have the holy door open, which is door number six. So in case you're lost, we're at the very bottom of the diagram. And you go through door number five. <coughs> Let me catch up with what I was saying before. If you go at a busy time, you've got a long line. But it, it goes pretty quickly. So don't, in other words, if you come when it's busy, don't give up. Don't give up hope. Bathrooms are tucked right about in there. <laughs> OK, and then there's two other spots. Rome is not very bathroom friendly. But St. Peter's is, is fine, OK? So you, you want to go in door number five. And for a reason I'm not going to tell you, rather I'm going to wait 
till the middle of my talk to tell you the reason. When you walk into door number five, first I want you to have a postcard ready to send me. That I'm only half serious, but I'd love to get a postcard. And I want you to write on your postcard, Professor, I followed your directions when I walked into door number five and I kept my head down. Now you might think I'm asking you to be reverent. Well, I am in a way, but this has nothing to do with reverence. In fact, you're welcome to walk in and look to the right and you will see under number 14, that's where the Pieta is. So you're welcome to look over there, but don't look around the Basilica. Why? I'm going to ask you to wait until you stand right about where the seven is, that direct middle, and then open your eyes and lift your head and look forward. And I'll tell you why halfway through my talk. Let's look at just a couple other interesting gems in here while, while, while we've got the map open. I think I'll look at number 68 on, on the left, which is a monument to John the 23rd. Who knows where John the 23rd is located in the history of the papacy? You've all taken great history classes with Dr. Hansen and others. And I know you know that he started the Second Vatican Council, which although others went to wild places with that council, he never intended that. Now, if you, uh, let's sh let me show you two other things. If you look up this, what's called the central nave, it's in my own handwriting, so you can barely read it. That's the big, big uh, main part of the giant aisle. And it can be filled with chairs, and it's usually you can't walk up the main aisle. It's roped off or it's filled with chairs. But there's an amazing phenomenon that I don't have marked in here in any way that students often miss. In the tile, which you can either directly look at or look at over the ropes that are kind of keeping you from walking right up the central nave, in the tile are diagrams of the fronts of other gigantic churches in the world. I'll just give one example. The, the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C., which many of you have seen. It's humongous. It fits inside of St. Peter's. And when you look at the tile, there will be a row of tile, I think it looks like a door, that lets you know if you were to put that church inside of St. Peter's, and push it all the way up to the front, push it in there, you know, nice and snug, here's where the door would be. <laughs> and then you take another few steps and you find another huge monstrosity of a church labeled in the tile. Here's where it would be. So it's just a neat, a neat phenomenon to re realize how, what's the word everyone uses? Gi ginormous, yeah, I got ginormous. I gotta get some of these neat words down boss words. <laughs> when I was in sixth grade, you didn't say cool, you said boss. And I'm trying to resurrect this custom. Okay, so let's look at a couple other boss things. If you, if you sneak up the middle there, and now you go to this number eight. Yeah, number eight, I didn't think I'd be able to see it. It's a statue of St. Peter, it's black, and he's got two bare feet and one is perfectly formed, very intricately. The other used to be perfectly formed, but it's the one that pilgrims are allowed to touch. You're not allowed to touch any other statuary. Uh, but this one is exposed right out in the open and pilgrims touch it or kiss it and it's worn smooth over the centuries. It's a wonder to behold. My favorite painting in the Basilica is, if you look at number 56, now we're getting up toward the Baldacchino in the middle there, and just to the left and a little bit down is 56. It's called, if you look at the key, the Altar of the Lie. And unless I've made a mistake here, <laughs> this is the, in, in understanding the Bible, when you read Acts of the Apostles, you read about the lie that Ananias and Sapphira told to, to Peter. And it had to do with everyone who joined the community uh, pooled their goods in common, okay? and they basically decided to hold back while pretending that they were doing the right thing, and they lied about it. And if I, uh, if I tell you what Peter did, 
or what happened through Peter, I'd be giving away the whole story. But the picture is extraordinarily dramatic. And it makes you say, Dear God, I, I, I know most of my lives have been venial sins, but I, I'm going to really work to avoid that, lest I slip into a greater one and suffer the same fate as Ananias and Sapphira. If you go up to the very top, I think it's 48. Okay, if you don't, haven't found it, don't worry. It's the altar to St. Leo. Okay, St. Leo, I'm making connections obviously to under the Bible and Western Theotrad. St. Leo, Council of Chalcedon, 451, writes a famous document called the Tome of Leo. It's done so perfectly that they put it into the council documents as an infallible statement. He solves the problem of the two natures of Christ by coming up with the term the hypostatic union, that they're one person and two natures. Uh, the word hypostasis and the word usia and about a hundred other words had caused enormous rifts and huge heresies that you'll learn all about in Western Theotrad, but Leo is the hero. He also, when Attila the Hun came right up to the gates of Rome to plunder and let loose, Leo went out by himself, I think on horseback. We have no record of what they said, but Attila turned around. Hence, Leo the Great. I think I'm, oh, I got one more, and that is 28 and 29. 28 is my favorite number, so I got to include that. And 28 is the altar of St. Jerome, and in under, under the Bible, you learn that St. Jerome is the famous translator of the Vulgate, and to date him, he dies 10 years before Augustine, 420. Augustine dies in 430. 431 is the Council of Ephesus, and neither of them quite made it. And then right next to that altar is the altar of St. Basil. Basil is one of the three Cappadocian fathers. And if you ever see the patriarch of the theology department, Father David Balash, he's the kind of elderly now and not teaching, but loves to talk to people. If you go to Mass at Cistercian, he's, he's kind of hunched over and very reverently, he's the last one out of, of Mass. Everyone waits until he heads out. There's a big step that he's, there's someone waiting there to help him down, but the congregation can't see that there's someone there, and so it looks like he's walking and just falls into a huge pit, and then everybody quietly leaves. Okay, if you're sitting in the left-hand side of the church, at least. Now, why did I say that? Because he's the world-renowned expert on one of the other Cappadocian fathers, Gregory of Nyssa. And we also have Gregory of Nazianzus and Basil. So, just a, a little connection to UD there. And I'm done telling you about the map. Any questions about how this map works? What I would do is buy yourself a, a, a nice guidebook that has a map like this, and, and then what, it, what the, the, cop, the guidebook I have, I just photocopied this, and they have a, a nice paragraph about every one of these items. Okay? Now, the secret discovery that you're about to make, we're on the verge of making the secret discovery, I have not found in any guidebook. I challenge you to find someone else, some other author who has found my secret discovery that's going to be the basis of a million seller, New York Times bestseller mystery novel co-authored by one of you and me. We're going to split, split the profits here, okay? And, and, and we have to agree that a good amount of the tithe goes to a great school I heard of called UD. Yeah, yeah. But we're going to we're going to hit it rich together. But but if someone else has discovered this, we can still write the novel. But we have to give credit to someone else. As of right now, as of this minute, I am the sole discoverer of this. Not the sole discoverer, the sole person who's written and talked about it. And I know there's got to be more out there. But I, I had a, I even got a student. I, I don't know if I hi, hired her. Or she just did it uh, on her own initiative but to look at guidebooks that I hadn't looked at and s just to see, especially the more sophisticated guidebooks, see if it's in there. And it wasn't. So I'm still interested. I won't be disappointed when I find that someone else has, has found it. 
Um, but nobody's written the mystery novel, I can guarantee you that. And I don't think anybody's uh, written much about it at all. So we better do it. We better find it. Any questions on the map? There's another beautiful view. What does it look like? A key. The keys of Peter. Okay? Whatever you consider loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. Whatever you consider bound in, on earth is bound in heaven. I, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The gates of heaven will not prevail against it. I give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What's the key to the kingdom of heaven? When you die entering into the transcendent realm with a heart, an inner, your inner, inner metaphysical being, containing a participation in the Trinitarian life. At least a slender portion of it, if not a massive portion of it. Not that you've become God, but that you partake or participate in God, put otherwise, God infuses into you his inner Trinitarian life. When you die, you want that because that makes you eternally safe. And you have the privilege of growing in it ad infinitum. There's no limit, even for those who are the highest saints. Even if you end up in purgatory, you have a slender slice of it or quite a good slice of it. And again, you have an opportunity to grow in it. You also have to purge yourself of some of the bad stuff then. But that's a pretty good deal, a pretty indulgent God. And that's what you want to make sure that you, um, that what, what you have when you die. So that's what the keys of the kingdom are. You want to find what's the key to entering into that kind of kingdom. And the key is sanctifying grace, the indwelling of the Trinity. Where do you get the key? Who, do you, who has it? Peter has it. Where do you find Peter? Oh, it's not just Peter. It's his 11 friends. Where do you find them? They're the successors of the apostles and the successor of the Bishop of Rome, Peter, that have been with us for centuries upon centuries. Even the worst ones that you learn about in history class, Alexander VI. I can't bear to even tell you one story about him right now. It's just that it involved mistresses. Um, even, even he did not uh, renege on a point of doctrine. And a couple of the worst popes did a absolutely wonderful jobs defending sacred doctrine, the deposit of faith. So they've got the key. Hence, the shape of the key. Now we're inside. I'm just going to follow these. The, the order of the slides is just a little different than the order of my texts. Okay? if you don't mind. So what I'd like you to do is go to the almost the just below the sec, just, just below the second half of the page where it says from the front doors to the beginning of the left transept. Okay? Now, if this is St. Peter's, you're walking up the middle nave Okay, and before and the left transept is going to be the part that's over here. The chair and the window are going to be here. The right transept is going to be here. Way the heck up there is the big dome. Walk back down the, the nave and, and then leave the, leave the basilica and go out on the porch this way. That's where the rest of the key is. That's where the rest of the... So you all have a kind of perspective on this. So... From the front doors, now you're at the front doors, to the beginning of the left transept. And you're going to look up, and you're going to see the giant black letters. And this is where Luke is quoted. Let's translate, even if you don't know Latin. I have prayed for you, O Peter, that you not defect or abandon your faith.
And when you have turned, turned from hesitancy, turned from fear, when you have turned, conversus, confirm your brothers. That doesn't mean that, strengthen them in their faith. Confirm them in their faith. That's all Luke says. Okay? That's Luke's version of, I give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Confirm them in their faith. Let them, know, let them know what the keys are, you might say. Okay? And here you see, et to, the U looks like a V, aliquando, conversus, confirma, and I think that's about as far as we'll get. You get this the beginning of fratres, the, just the beginning of brothers. Okay? So if you happen to be making your journey through St. Peter's, and this is the first part you see, as will be the case for many of you, and immediately your friend says to you, what, what are those gold letters up there? Well, you've got your first answer, okay? Now, why didn't I put this at the beginning of my page? Because I want to begin with Matthew, which is, takes a certain centrality. So let's go on. That's exactly what we just looked at. Another, another version of it. <clears throat> this one I'm not going to... Uh, it's very hard to see the black letters. But what you can see is the... Now you can see almost all four pillars of the Baldacchino. It's shot at an angle. And you can look up, 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 up. And that's the, that's the dome from the inside. And this is the right transept, and this is the left transept. And pardon me if I make a mistake on any of these items. Okay, now what you've just done is you've said to yourself, self, that's pretty big dome up there. Now your neck is craning like this. Your friend is lying down on the ground to look at the at, at the dome and you're all surrounding him so that the guards don't see him at least for a little bit. Okay? There's one other thing you can do when you're in St. Peter's and when you're at St. John Lateran, uh, Santa Maria Maggiore, St. Mary Major, and uh, San Paolo Fuori de la Morda, St. Paul outside the walls. Those are the four big ones. Uh, and they're the easiest places where you can find priests saying, hearing confessions. And you get away from the crowd. This is connected to the security personnel. <laughs> There's a connection here. Okay, you get away from the crowd and it's all roped off. So a huge part of the church in the, in the front, let's not worry about pointing it out on the map, is walled, is, is roped off, and there's like three or four or five or six wooden confessional big hunks. And if you want to go to confession, you get to go in there and sit down on a pew. Now, the guards are very aware that there are people who want to go in there to get some silence and to sit on a pew, and they don't want to go to confession. So they might give you a hard time. So you have to convince them <laughs> that you, you're not just wandering around trying to find an empty, quiet place. You've got to let them know in your broken Italian or your fluent Italian or English. You've got to let them know that y you really are a penitent. And they're gr it's a great place to go to confession. The old-fashioned big boxes and you kneel down and you don't, you're, vi you're visible to everyone, but nobody can hear you, of course. Except on one occasion, on one of my visits, when I heard, I was waiting to go to confession, and I heard an elderly old priest say, you did what? <laughs> How many times? <laughs> Don't worry, I've never heard that again. And, and it's just true. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I, did, I didn't just con commit a, a venial lie. Okay. Super hanc petram edificabo. Okay? 
Let's see if we can find this. It's supposed to be jumping right. Oh, there. Uh, I've got it circled in green. That's why I can't find it. <laughs> I'm, also, I'm over prepared. Okay, look at the sec section that says base of the central dome. Right, you're at the base of the central dome. Your your you're still covering up your friend who's lying down and try, now he's got his camera with his telephoto lens out. <laughs> okay, and you're still there, but you are responding to another one of your friends who says, "What's that say?" You told me what that Lucan passage was. What's that say? And you and you indicate you go around the entire dome with your friend and you point out to them. Let's translate. Uh, let's read. Uh, translate together. Uh, starting at the beginning, and then I'll show you wh when we get to this part right here. Together, you are Peter and super upon this Petram. Now, notice the ending Petram, accusative feminine noun. Petram, edificabo, I will build. And now we'll keep going. My church and the gates, the ports of hell in, in fairy will not prevail against it. And uh, skip TB, double, I will give to you the keys, claves, of the, uh, the keys of the kingdom regni of heaven, Chelorum. Good enough? You, you've impressed your friend, and you're going to impress your friend even more. Okay, here's more of the same. You are Petrus, and on this Petram, I will build my church. <clears throat> okay, if you need a power nap for 45 seconds, this is your chance. This is really a part where you can phase out, and I'll wake you up in 45 seconds. You'll notice that Petru, Petrus, you are Petrus, you are Peter, that's a masculine ending. And on this Petram, that's feminine. Which is it? Well, it's a feminine noun. Petra, 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 Petra. And the word, it's a word for rock. It's the word for rock. And Jesus takes this word for rock, which happens to be a feminine noun, but it's like really appropriate for giving a new name to Peter because he's going to be the rock solid key to your salvation and mine. Let us hope. And so he says, I'm going to, I'm going to call you rock, but I'm not going to keep a feminine ending for a masculine guy. So I've got to change it to Petrus. Okay? Now, you'll find those who want to deny the, the place of Peter using this grammatical change to try to demonstrate that Jesus can't be founding his church on Peter because if he were following, if founding it on Peter, he'd say, either you are Petrus and on this Petrus I will build my church, or keeping with the Latin, you are Petram, and on this Petram I will build my church. Since he says, you are Petrus, and on this Petram I will build my church, Peter and rock are two different things. And the rock means maybe his rock-like faith, which doesn't make much sense because his faith wasn't that solid at that time. But if you ever hear that argument, now you know how to answer it. It's a simple grammatical point. And this is, uh, you might think this is a, a, pro a argument used by heavy-duty Protestant scholars. The heavy-duty scholars don't buy that ar the false argument at all. It's a popularized version for people uh, uh, to, to get popular tidbits that they can kind of throw at the Catholic faith. And you can quickly show how it doesn't work. Now, you have to remember the whole text is in Greek. This is the Latin translation. But exactly the same phenomena is in the Greek. The words sound I identical. They just, the letters look totally different.
we won't spend much time on this one. Oh, except, except to note that the Baldacchino is, you're looking at it from the left transept and you can see it really well. But nothing compares to being there, so I'm not going to uh, pretend that this does much. Here you see basically the same thing. There's something really cool here. Flesh and blood have not revealed this to you. Okay? Flesh and blood have not revealed this to you. And you will find that text at the very end of my first text under the words right transept. Look at the end. Quis caro et sanguis non relevavit tibi. And I want to continue with that text, and I'm not sure I have a picture of it to use or not. I don't think I do. But you know what it looks like, okay? So from the text we just covered, we go backwards, okay? Now I'm going to say something, and I want those of you who are studying Latin to t catch me. I'm going to make a little mis intentional mistake. I'm going to quote from the Bible as I know it. And Peter said, you are Christ, the Son of the living God. J Jesus just said, what do people say that I am? And they say, some people think you're this, some people that. Peter says, Jesus says, who do you say I am? Peter, you are Christ. The, uh, Peter said, you are Christ, the Son of the living God to which Jesus said, is implied, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon's his name, uh, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And now, I can't help but go to the next line, which we've already covered. And you are Peter, does the name change, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, and I give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Okay? So, Anybody catch my, the hint, my mistake is right at the beginning, yes. Okay, everybody look at the third word. Dixisti isn't third person singular that you would use, Peter said. Now, if you read the Latin Bible and any, any translation, like the, the one you use in understanding the Bible class, it'll say in English, Peter said, third person singular, he said. Here it says, O oh, Peter, not dixit, but dixisti, you said. So what he's done, you, you, you take it from here. What has the artist done? L l louder. He's directing it to Peter. He's personalized it. W why? No, a couple of reasons. One, archaeological. Peter's down there. You can take a Scavi tour. You don't get to look at his skeleton or anything, but you get to go right past his bones. And there's a wonderful couple of books on the controversies surrounding this and the fact that we have apodictic certainty now that Peter's down there under the altar, under the Baldacchino. And you get to go down there on a fairly expensive tour Okay, that Monsignor Fucinaro somehow has the magical ability to pull out of uh, out of a hat, magic trick. We have 20 openings for the tour to the Scavi. First to sign up, see me after the Monday night meeting. Everything's there but Monsignor's accent or uh, mode of speaking, which I'm not trying to imitate. I could do a different imitation. Ah, this glass of wine has a little bit of a taste of uh, pineapple to it. Okay, so you, you get the picture. The artist has personalized it. Now, every successor to Peter, when they look at that, they are in the footsteps of Peter, in succession to Peter, so they're going to read it the same way. Let me give you an example. I brought up Leo. 
Guess how the tome of Leo begins when they insert it into the Council of Chalcedon. Peter said through Leo, Christ has two natures that are hypostatically divine, hypostatically united into one person. That's my paraphrase of a paragraph. So when Leo wasn't, this building wasn't around when Leo was there, but let's jump up to someone like John Paul II or Benedict XVI. When they say, you said, Dixisti, the you they know as Peter and every other pope and, P and John Paul or Benedict. Okay? So th this is where the mystery novel takes place. The artist is solving in a secret way. There's, there's a pope who's on the, on the verge of uh, apostatizing, teaching heresy, like coming out with an infallible statement that abortion is okay in 35% of the cases, some, something like that. He's about to apostatize. And this is, I, I used a, not a good example there because uh, that's a good 20th century example. We've got to go back to the 16th or 17th century when the artist is on the verge of drawing this and it's all half done. And uh, the, the, the Pope at the time is about ready to do something absolutely disastrous and it's going to have all these political implications. And by putting, by changing the grammar, he's able to, and then planting a, a letter on the Pope's desk that he sees with some information about looking at these texts. The Pope then sees this and changes his mind. And then you surround this plot with all sorts of murders and exciting nighttime trips to the Vatican and attempts to kill the artist who has come up with not one but three instances of personalizing the text. Okay, enough on the mystery novel, okay? I promise, no more. We'll skip the very middle text, which is the central nave heading toward the front doors. I'll just let you know that now you are not heading up, heading up looking at the Lucan text. Now you are heading back to the front doors and you're looking at the continuation of the massively long Matthean text. And I already quoted it in English, so let's not do that for, uh, because I have three minutes left. Let me show you the two other places where this happens. When you're in the left transept, they're in, into the Gospel of John. He said three times to you, Peter said, I'm sorry, Jesus said three times, pay no attention to that man behind the screen. Let me start all over. Uh, Jesus said to Peter three times, a third time, do you love me? Where did I screw up? It's got to change. Je Jesus said to, said to you, TB, to you, Peter, not to Peter. And he didn't, he said, so it's, personalized. He said it to you, do you love me? And so likewise, just take the same situation that we studied with the opetere dixisti and shift it, mutatis mutandis, to the new situation where he's talking to John. And then I, I have all of these insights in the answer key, okay? I give you the answer, but we've just figured that out, or you've just figured that out. The challenge question, what might be the purpose of this textual change? What effect does it have on the reader? The question of what effect it has on you is the next question that goes unanswered. It's for you to meditate on in your meditation tonight. Okay? And I think you can figure it out, even though you're not popes. Okay? Part two, the Holy Spirit window, the Baldacchino and sacramentality. You might think that this is really going to drive us over the edge, but... I warned you that we might not get to part three, and part two is meant to be a quick conclusion. Remember what, I pro what you're doing as you're waiting, 
and you've got your head down. Dear Professor Lowry, loving Rome, thanks, I remember your lecture, I've got your notes here, I'm impressing all of my friends. My head is still down, but I have now walked to the center. Okay. It's indescribable. It all just made sense to me. I'm speechless. Signed, Ruth, Jacob, John, whoever you are, and try to remember to put a stamp on it and mail it to me. Okay, when you look up, you see the Holy Spirit window. Now, all three persons of the Trinity you want to be close friends or buddies with. Okay? All three persons. But the Holy Spirit represents a certain side of the Trinity, namely the indwelling part of it. Jesus represents the walking with you part. The Father represents the telos, the final end part. They all three do all this stuff together, but certain of them maximize a certain part of the role, and the indwelling part is what the Holy Spirit does. That's why we speak about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We don't usually hear the word indwelling of the Father. We do hear indwelling of the Trinity, participation in the Trinitarian life. So, quick theology class there, wrapped up into 30 seconds. So you, you look and you see the symbol for sanctifying grace, the indwelling of the Trinitarian life of the Holy Spirit. If the sun's shining, great. If it's not, it's still beautiful. You see it, and then because you attended this lecture and other people have told you this, you see the baldacchino. And you realize that you only see the indwelling of the Spirit through Peter. Because he's down there. And the baldacchino is there in his honor. You want to get to that window, you can go around. The Catechism says, Christ has made baptism entry into the church, the normal means of salvation. But Christ is not bound by the sacraments. So if there's a Hindu somewhere who has no clue about this, he's going to wander all over the place and he's going to sneak up in behind and all unbeknownst to him and he's going to get some of that and you might meet him in heaven. And, he, and the great thing is he'll have all, all the opportunity in the world to grow in heaven. As we all will, Okay, but a little head start. So you suddenly, it all fits together. You have best access to that in, through, and by means of the church. Where Peter is, there is the church. Where the apostles are in succession, and where the successor, uh, the, and Peter, the head of the apostles, is in succession, there is the church. It makes for a great building, but it's finally not a building. It's a state of being called sanctifying grace. And that's what you want to, when you go to Rome, your main goal is to take the life of sanctifying grace that's in you. If it's not in you, it's really easy to get back. All you have to do is say, sorry for screwing up. 4,500 million times, I hereby resolve to do better. So all you got to say. And it's back in you. Now, that's a lot of room to grow. So and in Rome, you get it all fixed up and you let it grow. In about a million ways, perhaps the most beautiful and the most striking and one of the earliest being St. Peter's Basilica. I went one minute over. I'll see you all, and I'm more than happy to keep talking and do the next section for anybody who wants to stay uh, five or ten minutes. And then if you want to discuss other things further, we can do that casually out on the porch or, or in here. Up, up to you. But you've got a million things to do, so I'm not, ex uh, I'm not ex expecting anybody to stay. So. Thanks a lot. Have a great afternoon.